what we're going to do this evening, we're almost done with the first story of Israel. So we've gone through steps one through, through five, Abraham to King David. There's one more step that we're just going to briefly read. Um, Israel unified in the land under King David. And then that will take us to the sixth and final step of the first story of Israel. And then we'll transition into the second story of Israel. Before we really get into the second story of Israel, we'll go back and just kind of do a big picture, maybe some takeaways from the first story of Israel before we move on. So that's kind of our master plan tonight. And uh, Papa Ali, would you mind getting started with a prayer? Amen. Thank you. All right. You mentioned something there that is maybe a kind of a goal of this, of this study is just approaching the scripture slightly differently, looking at everything from the story of scripture from beginning to end, testing it, looking for common themes, looking to see if the story itself is consistent with itself from Genesis to Revelation or if there's internal conflict. Um, and as we're doing that and looking at the story of scripture beginning in Genesis, from the perspective of relationship and the relationship that the creator describes and seems to desire with his creation with, with humanity. And as we go through this, so what I'm hoping is coming up is some things that, that sound and look a little bit different than the usual approach, which is just to do a topical study or to do a study of the, the, the book of Galatians, for example, just do a focus study, but really back up and look at the big picture. And one of the things is, okay, the story that scripture tells beginning in Genesis all the way through the gospels, does it have an impact on how we see the world and how we see ourselves. Because if it changes how we see ourselves, well, then that changes our purpose and maybe has an impact on also what we believe and expect for the future, our destiny. And one of the things that, that you mentioned in your prayer is here we are today on, on a timeline at least. Here's, and here's a question. Are we in a priesthood? And if you're like me, um, that's not, you don't hear that talked about a lot. Are we in a priesthood? So that's a question. And then another thing that we're going to get into, which we've already raised, but it's just a question, but we're going to get into it even more in this second story of Israel, is who are we? And if I were to give us only one of three options, are we Jews? Are we Israel? Are we Gentiles? So that's also a question that we don't talk about very much. But if we look at everything through the lens of Scripture, does it have anything to say about who we are and our identity today? And that's the idea. So certainly as we get into the second story of Israel, we're going to get into some themes that are uncommon and maybe even wrong. And so as I present all of this, I ask you guys to challenge it because some of the stuff like we got into, well, who is scriptural Israel? Is it different than political Israel? These can be contentious discussions and then people can get really ramped up emotionally. And so I actually anticipate some disagreements and I anticipate uh, some challenging of each other as I present this. But of course, you know, the ability to, to disagree in love and allow the scriptures to be the final authority, that's kind of our approach in this study. So as we go through this, we did the first five steps of the story of Israel. One, we acknowledged the nations that came out of Babel that spread all across the earth through the differenti differentiation of language. And this is what is called the goyim, the nations, the Gentiles. 
And out of the Gentiles, a man was called Abram in Genesis 12. And promises began to be made through this man, Abram, first to he and his seed, but then also to all nations. And the approach we're looking at here is beginning in Genesis 12, the rest of the scripture is simply how the creator is accomplishing his promises to Abraham. So that's the lens that we're looking at. And he's doing it through his relationship with the nations, and he's doing it through his relationship with Israel, this set-apart nation, this Goy Gadol. So we looked at that. Abraham was called out of the nations, and the promises began to be made, which spans from Genesis 12 to Genesis 49. Then, as promised in Genesis 15, The offspring of Abram became a nation, but they were in a land that did not belong to them. They were sojourning amongst the Egyptians. But as promised to the day, as promised through the mechanism of the Passover, the blood of the lamb and the days of unleavened bread, the Israelites were led out of slavery and to Mount Sinai. That was the third step, the wedding at Mount Sinai. And what we've looked at is what happened at Mount Sinai truly was a wedding. And it had all the elements of a, of a wedding um, ceremony and a wedding commitment, including the ketubah, which was the written document, the marriage document called the Book of the Covenant that was placed inside the ark. But then, less than 40 days later, the golden calf breach of Israel, adulterous Israel. And so then we have the book of the law, which is actually a divorce document that was not placed inside the Ark of the Covenant, but in a pocket outside of the covenant as a witness against Israel's sin and a testimony to their sin. And that's when the Levitical priesthood was initiated. So that was the first five steps. Now, there is a sixth step. So after the golden calf breach, and we get into... um, the details of the Levitical priesthood and the book of the law. This was a faithless generation. And after the 12 spies came back from the land and gave an evil report, they were punished for wandering 40 years in the wilderness until that generation, that faithless generation died off. And then the next generation would take the land under Joshua. Now here, as we're getting into taking the land, there's many battles that occur. We have the um, nation of Israel demanding a king like all the other nations. And under the, the, the um, Judge Samuel, he, uh, the creator told Samuel, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. Let them have their king. Saul was raised up as king. That was very chaotic. And then David takes the crown, and it happens in two stages. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 4. Because this is step number six. This is actually a unified Israel in the land. Somebody read that for us. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 4. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh Gilead were the ones you who buried Saul. So David was crowned king first over Judah. Now, at that time, the other tribes had not accepted him as king. He was only um, pronounced king over Judah. But then, as time goes on, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, read 1 through 5, if you would. Because here is where all the remaining tribes of Israel accept David as king. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke and saying, Indeed, you are your bone and your flesh. We are all your bones and your flesh. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed king David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. And so there we have it. So that, the way that we're structuring this study, the first story of Israel spanning from the promises made to Abram 
to a united nation of Israel in the land. Now, before we go on to the second story of Israel, a couple of things I want to pull out because it's going to have an impact on how we understand the second story of Israel. So it goes back to the beginning. If we're going to look at this story of Israel through the lens of relationship, the relationship that the creator has with the nations and the relationship that the creator has with this set apart nation, that's one kind of organizing theme as we go through the story. Now, we did ask this question early on. Who is the creator here in the Garden of Eden that created creation and that interacted with Adam and Eve? Was that the father or was that the word who later became the son? What, what did we determine? The word. And that's important because if there is scriptural reason to believe that this was the word that created creation and interacted with Adam and Eve, all these other questions flow from that. Who was it who made promises to Abraham, the father or the word who became the son? And then who was it who gave the commandments to Moses? Was that the father or was that the word who became the son? And who was it that actually married Israel on Mount Sinai? Was that the father or was that the word who became the son? And then, of course, who divorced Israel after the golden calf breach at Mount Sinai? Was that the father or was that the word? The way that we answer that question from Scripture has a lot to do with how we understand the second story of Israel. So just as a, as a quick kind of review of kind of just takeaway points from the first story of Israel, again, looking to see if there is consistency in the story from beginning to end, just from the concept of relationship, we looked at the creator does require a intimate relationship, which requires a choice. And the choice in the, in the text is Satan, who always offers an easy temporary benefit. And according to the scriptures, which one did Adam and Eve tend to choose? The easy temporary benefit. And then we have uh, the people growing and, and covering the earth before Noah's flood. Which one did most people tend to choose? The easy way, even to the point of the destruction of Noah, and then be began to populate the earth again. Just three generations later, most of the people were choosing which option? Easy. easy temporary benefit. And then we get to Abraham, and he is called out of these nations. But now even with Israel, what are we seeing? They came to the Mount Sinai and were actually married to their creator, and within less than 40 days... Which one did they choose? The easy temporary benefit of the alternative. So between marriage and divorce was only 40 days. Yeah, because there was uh, the marriage that occurred and was documented in between Exodus 19 and Exodus 24, 11. That was a blood ratified marriage. And then um, Moses went back up the mountain for 40 days. And that's when we have um, the tumult outside the camp. And that's when the creator said, Moses, get down. These people have already, uh, how, did, how was it stated? These people have already uh, worshipped other gods. And so as we look through the lens of relationship and we look through what happened at Mount Sinai with all five elements of a marriage ceremony fulfilled, we see that as adultery. And let's go to um, uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 again, because again, it's important, I believe, to try to look at this entire drama through the lens of the creator. Because I could just be kind of a romantic type and want to say, oh, that looks like a marriage to me. And so we're just going to call it a marriage. But the question is, <laughs> from the perspective of, uh, of the creator, how did he look at this, at this event at Mount Sinai? Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. Now, this again, this is Jeremiah who is prophesying roughly here about the future, but he's referencing the past as he shares a prophecy for the future. Somebody read that for us. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. 
This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Thank you. And I ask you to go back and look at that closely and even go back into the Hebrew because the, the language in the Hebrew is, though I was a husband to them. And so from the Creator's perspective, what happened at Mount Sinai, and again, that's just one example. There's many examples all the way through. And that's another thing that we're going to be testing as we go through. Does the Creator actually look at His ideal relationship with His people as a marriage? And we're going to test this as we go through. But then again, continuing to test this. So here in the Garden of Eden, we had, he desires relationship, which requires a, uh, an alternative. This creator also claims the authority to establish law and to establish rules. And according to the story of the Garden of Eden, if Adam and Eve were to be faithful to his laws and faithful to his rules and not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what would they have had? Blessings or cursings? Blessings. Blessings. But as told to them, if you disobey these laws and you choose this easy temporary benefit, will they have blessings or cursings? So now here we are with a full nation here. Has this arrangement changed now that the Creator has been making promises through Abraham to a people, a Goy Gadol? Is the relationship with them the same? And one interesting place to look is Deuteronomy 28. So now we're, we're getting into this area here, but we're still in the first story of Israel. So Deuteronomy 28, I just want to read the first half and the second half and look at the consistency of the relationship that the creator wants with his people. So verse one, now it shall come to pass, this is before they take the land under Joshua. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of the ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in. And blessed shall you be when you go out. And so, pretty clear echo of what he told Adam and Eve. But then, what if they were to disobey? The second part of Deuteronomy 28, starting in verse 15. But it shall come to pass... If you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to carefully observe all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. And this is a prophecy of Israel that we're going to pick up in the second story of Israel. Now, this is also important in the second story of Israel who is the Lord that created creation and gave the commandments to Moses? The Father or the Son who would become the Word? The Son. And just for a quick review, going back, proving that from the text, from the Bible itself. Because this whole God's, Godhead of Elohim that we find in the first chapter of Genesis, this plurality of the Godhead is not answered. That mystery is not answered until John chapter 1. And so like we looked at last time, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, we can read that again, but it says that all things were created through the word, not one thing was created that was not created through the word. And then in verse 14, it says, the word took flesh and dwelt temporarily with men 
identifying the Messiah as the Word who became the Son. And then again, this whole idea of obedience. And what we're going to find in the second story of Israel, did obedience and the command for obedience change after Jesus came in the flesh and was crucified? No. What does he say in John 14, 15? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, most commonly... What does it sound like if somebody is trying to keep the commandments to love God? What does that sound like? Sounds like being a Judaizer, right? Yeah. So how do we how do we reconcile how can how do we reconcile all of this? And I would propose we're not going to tonight, but as we read the second story of Israel, I think that we can see how all of this is reconciled. Uh, I grew up always thinking that it was God where you said it was Jesus. And I understand John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and word, the Word was God. But then you read Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right. So how do you reconcile those two? Well, so, it's, maybe it's another excellent question. You know, one of the things that uh, I have thought of, if we totally understand God, then we're God. <laughs> now, that I think is interesting because in reality, no matter how many years we dedicate ourselves to answering that question, who is the God of the Bible? At the end of the day, we are still the finite trying to understand the infinite. However... Are we given clues in Scripture? We are. So, on the one hand, can we be so bold as to say that we've come to 100% certainty we know who the God of the Bible is in every detail, in every answer to every question? That's probably a little um, puffed up to be able to proclaim that. However, is it also a worthwhile endeavor if we wish to have a closer relationship with Him? Absolutely. 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 So I put this out there just as a hanging question. And I will propose that at, at, when the time comes, we are going to come to this word here, love. What is scriptural love and how is it different than the way our culture defines love? Is it the same or is it drastically different? Amen and amen. Okay. I have, I have a question. Yeah. So what about, him? I'm, maybe did this last week, but... Genesis 126, then God said, let us make men, you know, kind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the world. Did you re-answer that last week? Elohim. That, that Hebrew word, us, let us, that is the Hebrew word Elohim. It's the plural of Almighty, so Creator you're Almighty. You're saying God and Jesus together. Well, so like, like we just pointed out, this whole mystery of the plurality of the Creator in Scripture, is not answered. That mystery is not answered until John chapter 1. It answers that. That's a starting point. Now, only by two or three witnesses is a, uh, is a matter settled, right? We have, to get, we have to add a lot more Scripture to that to actually test that, to see if that ends up being consistent. But that's one of our goals is to, as we continue to look at the story of Israel, are these confirmed or are we, in, in, are we seeing that the scripture is consistent with itself from Genesis to Revelation or are we seeing gross irreconcilable contradictions? Because if we see gross irreconcilable contradictions, that would, that would question our original mandate for this class, which is to test the scriptures to see, just like we read in, in Romans, are the scriptures reliable for the purpose of renewing the mind and transforming a life? Because if we find great consistency beginning to end, that is more evidence that the Bible actually is what it claims to be, the inspired word of the creator to his creation. 
if we find gross inconsistencies, it may suggest that it's a very interesting book with a lot of good moral ideas, but belongs on the shelf with Aesop's fables. This is coming from the minds of men, not from the minds of the creator. That's what we're testing. That's what we're testing. Yeah. Are you saying, okay, when it, stop, it talks in Genesis, God said, let there be light, God, all of this. Mm-hmm. And that's God. Okay. Is that That God? is Elohim, the mm-hmm. plural. Uh-huh. Yes. But are you saying that's the word right there to creating? What I would say is, let's go to John chapter 1. Let's read it again. Well, where it says the word. But... The word. Okay. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were created through the Word, and not one thing that was created was created through God. And all the dialogue in the Old Testament is Jesus because that's the Word. Because. So we looked at that last time because there's another way to answer that question. According to Scripture, Jesus also said, I and the Father are one. Are one. That's in there. But also, according to Scripture, has anyone seen the Father? Let's go to John chapter 1, verse 18. And then we can go to John chapter 6, verse 46. Let's just, let's just read the scriptures for what it says. Uh, go first to John chapter 1, verse 18. <laughs> no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son... It was in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. So in that context, none have seen God. Now again, th- there's a whole other study that we've done, which is called Trashy English Words. And it's a long study. We started with faith, hope, and love. You talk about three trashy English words that have lost all original meaning. Trashy, trashy words. The word God is another trashy English word. Because I can say the word God, and all of a sudden, you have at least three questions. Are you talking about the God of the nations, like maybe Tammuz? Are you talking about God the Holy Spirit? Are you talking about God the Son? Are you talking about God the Father? The word God is an incredibly trashy English word. It's a very nonspecific word. Now we're getting into, okay, there's original Hebrew, there's original Greek. Okay, how careful do we need to be? Well, on one hand... Maybe we don't need to be so careful. But on the other hand, if we're asking interesting questions, it's going to require us to dial down a little bit deeper. So let's also read John chapter 6, verse, I think it's either 46 or 48. I don't have it in front of me. Because what that said is, none have seen the Father except the Son who came from the Father. So if that's the case, then who interacted with Adam and Eve? Who interacted with Noah? Who interacted with Abram? Who did Moses see? According to Scripture, it wasn't the Father. It was the Son, the Word. I was going to say, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is one. Mm -hmm. There have been theologians ever since the beginning that have debated that and tried to understand it. And none of them have come up with a good explanation. Oh, and you talk about some circular arguments. They start to... You know, sound like, well. I would just contend, we just have to, as you said, let the, let the Bible speak. Yes. Speed, and there are things that we just cannot, how can we comprehend the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and they're, and they're, but they're one, one God. That doesn't make any sense to me. It is, the, it is the finite trying to understand the infinite. But also, let's look at this. Um, and I'm going to probably get it wrong. Let's go to Proverbs 26, verse 2. Well, can we say what uh, John said? Yeah, actually, hold on just a second, because I, I want to develop this, and, and I want you to read that. I believe it's Proverbs 26, 2. Somebody read that for me. It may be the wrong one. But it has to do with the glory of God and the glory of kings. This is kind of interesting. Did I pick the right one? Um, ugh, that ain't it. Um, I'll have it next time, but it goes like this. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to seek it out. So, these in- that's why I love interesting questions. Okay. 
what is it, what is it 25? Mm -hmm. Two? Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's I was close. Go ahead and read that for us. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search out a matter, is the glory of kings. As the heavens are high and the earth is deep, so the hearts of kings are unsearchable. Interesting. Which, and of course, uh, I hate to go too deep on a rabbit trail. Why did the Messiah speak to the people in parables? According to Scripture. According to Scripture. So that they would not understand. No, that's not really what we immediately think of when we think about, well, why do you speak in parables? Oh, well, it's because we have God who's complex trying to explain something simple to simple, simple people so that we could understand better. No, as the scripture reads, he was asked by his disciples, why do you speak to them in parables? He said, so that in hearing they will not hear and with their eyes they will not see. Now, wait a minute. What, is he trying to make it confusing? But sometimes he explained the parables. Absolutely. Absolutely he did which is for those who are seeking the answer to the mystery to wrestle with. Yeah, yeah well, that's what I was going to say. It's for those that want have an open heart to it. Those that don't have an open heart, they don't hear a thing or so, don't, don't understand. Well, that's a whole other thing. Now, we're not, we, we probably will get into it in the second story of Israel, but the difference between those who are given a great delusion at the time of the end, why are they given a great delusion? because they did not develop a love of the truth. Well, those who do not love the truth, are they going to seek answers to these questions? Those who do love the truth, if you seek, you will. But what if you're not seeking? Again, we're kind of looking at according, reality 101 according to Scripture. How is this world set up? Now that we're in this, how is this particular world set up? The scripture explains it, and these are just reality 101 questions. All right, I'm getting way off track. <laughs> Let me get us back on track, because here's the reason to ask the question about, okay, who created creation in the Garden of Eden? Who interacted with Adam and Eve? Who interacted with Noah? Who interacted with Abraham? Because it leads to this question, who was the Lord who married Israel at Mount Sinai? Was it the Father or was it the Word? It was the Word. To whom did Israel commit adultery against? The Father or the Son? The Word. Now we're getting into a little deeper insight in the question that we asked on week two is, why did the Messiah have to come in the flesh? We're going to develop that. Now, on this whole idea of this marriage at Mount Sinai, where else do we see in Scripture this model of the creator marrying his people? Do we see it a second time? Yeah, Revelation. Now, fast, fast forwarding to the story of Israel number three, Revelation 19, 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteousness at the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So looking forward into the future, this is describing yet another marriage. Between whom? The Lamb, the Word, the Son who took flesh and dwelt temporarily among men, and His bride. And that's what we're going to get into in the story of Israel number three, the difference between the bride and the harlot. Because that frames all the information that's given to us, prophesied in the book of Revelation. This is where we intend to end up. But do we see, again, we've been saying, okay, here's this story from Genesis to Revelation. Are we seeing consistent patterns? Well, we see the loss of access to the tree of life. We see regaining the access to the tree of life. We see a marriage ceremony and adulterous Israel. But now we're seeing a marriage again 
to the Lamb, the Word, the Son who took flesh and dwelt temporarily among men. But we did point to one problem last week. According to Torah, which is the law of people or the law of the Creator? It's the law of the Creator. According to Torah, which are the commandments given by the Son to Israel, a divorced woman cannot remarry while the husband is still living. And we looked at that. Let's look at that again. So the law, these are the laws of adultery. So here the law is given before the marriage ceremony. And here is the law. This is Exodus 20. And this is right in the book of the covenant, Ketubah. This is in the marriage document. You shall not commit adultery. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. And then there's, and so we have all of this. Now, what about fast forwarding? What did Messiah say about this? Is it consistent with this? What about, you know, marriage, divorce, adultery? And so we looked at this last time. Here, here was the punchline. So he, Messiah, said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So he was reinforcing this law of adultery. But then Paul in his letter to, to the Romans, even expands on it more specifically. So listen to this language. Romans 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, while her husband lives, if she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she has married another man. What is the only way that the Creator, the Word, the Son who took flesh, could marry his bride Israel again? He had to die. If the husband dies. That's why he came in the flesh. Or at least seems to be a fundamental reason why this could not have been taken care of from the third heaven. He had to take flesh and suffer the way that he did. And we're also going to get into why the southern kingdom of Judah, who have been practicing the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread for centuries, had the Messiah right in front of them, and they didn't recognize him. They did not remember the sin of Israel and the open death position that Israel left when Moses intervened, when God said, I'm going to destroy Israel, I'm going to start over with you, Moses. Moses intervened, mercy was given, Israel was allowed to live under a divorce document and the Levitical priesthood, but the death position was left open. So, story of Israel number one. Adulterous Israel is divorced, but unable to remarry while the husband is living. They are under the book of the law, which is a witness against their sin. And Paul described it as a schoolmaster and under Levitical priesthood. So that takes us to where we just left off right there, a united Israel in the land under King David. But there are so many promises to Abraham that have yet to be fulfilled here under King David. Let's look at all the things that have yet to be fulfilled. Up to this point, is all Israel a blessing to all nations? No. They're only occupying a small portion of the promised land. That's Genesis 15. They're not yet possessing the gates of their enemies. They're not yet scattered north, south, east, west, as prophesied in Genesis 28. They're not yet experiencing the fullness of the birthright blessings promised to Joseph in Genesis 49. And Shiloh has not yet come. Now, Shiloh is a reference to the Messiah to whom all things belong. That is Genesis 49, verse 10. That hasn't happened yet. So all, there's so many of these promises made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that are not yet fulfilled, even though they are unified in the land as promised. Okay, so then we're going to get into Israel 
story visual number two. But before we do that, any more comments, corrections, thoughts on the story visual number one? We covered a lot of ground there. I don't know. I'm still bothered by the, 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 the way we say all of these activities, all the things that's happened with Israel and Jesus, the Word. I don't know. Somehow, I, I get the feeling we're, we're dissing our God Father. Well, but if you were to say that, wouldn't you have to say that the book of John is dissing God the Father? It's a fair question. Is the book of John dissing the, the, the Father? The Father and I are one. John 14. <coughs> also says that Jesus emptied himself and became man and dwelt among us. That's right. Took on a lesser glory. So, and this, he was God. Yeah. And you were saying, John 6, 46, it says, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Well, who is he talking about there? Obviously, the Son. That's actually, it's the Son speaking. Yeah. Yeah. How about that God gave his only begotten Son? Mm -hmm. Because when we read that, we think, oh, God gave his only begotten Son here thinking that, well, he wasn't given before that. He was only given here. But based on all the scriptures that we just read to each other, where was his son first given? Well, definitely here. Because he's the husband that while is still living, Israel cannot remarry. But probably even here. And then what, and I can't quote it off the top of my head, but he who was slain from the foundation of the world. He was given before the foundation of the world. Now, was he given here? Yes, he was. But why? Because he was also here. And he was also here. Does that fit? And is it consistent with what we read in John? Because that's the question. Is John dissing the Father? It's not used to think in that way. No. Looking at the story as a continuous story, not divided Old Testament and New Testament, obviously some important things happen here, but looking at it as a consistent story, does it agree with itself or does it is it in conflict with itself? And that's what we're testing. But Good observation. What else? Because I'm, there's a lot in here. So what else? Are we um, are we somewhat clear on the connection between the Book of the Covenant and the Melchizedek Priesthood, the Book of the Law and the Levitical Priesthood? Yeah. Pretty good on that. <laughs> Bill says yes. You got it, Bill? <laughs> Is that a real yes or a sarcastic yes? Clear as <laughs> Well, okay, so just again, big picture, because obviously this, all of this is so worthy of just going through again and just reading all of these stories again. But big picture, the only um, priesthood that is in Scripture connected to the Creator between Genesis 1 and the uh, Mount, marriage at Mount Sinai is the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. And the language is a kingdom of priests, a set-apart holy nation. That's the order of Melchizedek, a royal righteous priesthood. So this, this language of royal, this language of a kingdom of priests, all 12 tribes priesthood, that language is only connected with the Melchizedek priesthood. The divorce document after the golden calf breach is a kingdom of priests, all 12 tribes, or a kingdom with priests, only one tribe, and only under the, the bloodline of Aaron. Very, very different. And it is not a, it's not the same language. It's not kingdom of priests. It's not a holy nation. It is a nation with priests. 
And so that's the major differentiation is, and that's why we put in our Bibles, Exodus 19 through 24, verse 11, that is the book of the covenant, the marriage document. What follows, ending in Deuteronomy 31, that is called the book of the law, which is a divorce document. One is in the Ark of the Covenant, the other is placed in the pocket outside the Ark of the Covenant. Now that's important if we go through the second story of Israel and everything that happens leading to the first coming of the Messiah, because like we looked at briefly last week, what happened to the priesthood at his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension? The priesthood of, uh, did the priesthood remain the Levitical priesthood? What happened? It transferred to what? Order of Melchizedek. And that's what the writer of Hebrews was spending so much time on. But it wasn't just the writer of Hebrews. It was also Peter uh, talked about you are a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood. All that language is Melchizedek priesthood language. Those who, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, because Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 tells us who these people are, who are now a royal priesthood. Hmm. Verse 12 said, at that time, you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Let's take this step by step. So he's talking to the converted, right? These were people who were once among the nations. He says, remember, you were once Gentiles. And what was their reality as, as Gentiles, as the nations? Read that again. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of, covenants of pro promise. So they were aliens of the commonwealth of of Israel, they were without Christ the Messiah, and they were strangers to the covenants of promise. So right now, with what we've with what we have studied, what are the covenants of promise? The marriage document it also says having no hope and without God. And then finally, no hope. So remember all that. But then what? But now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So only through, what is their only hope under these circumstances? The nations. What is their only hope? Is to pass through the blood of Christ. And if they do that, what do they now have? They now have hope. They now are no longer strangers to the covenants of promise, but Heirs according to the promises made to Abraham, Genesis, uh, Galatians chapter 3. So now they are heirs according to covenants of promise. What else are they? They were once aliens of the commonwealth of Israel. Now they are part of the commonwealth of Israel. And with Christ, part of the commonwealth of Israel heirs according to the promise with hope. And that's the other one, with Christ. So it's only through the blood of the Messiah, the free gift of salvation, it's only those who pass through his blood that can claim the covenants of promise and be a part of the commonwealth of Israel. So to, to answer that question, who is Peter talking about when he's talking about this righteous uh, priesthood, this royal priesthood under the order of Melchizedek? That's who this is. Those who have passed through the blood of Messiah. They are now, they now answer to a Levitical priesthood or to the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. With that context, man, isn't this heavy? In this context. Because now, if we are Israel, the reason that we have the opportunity to pass through the blood of Messiah is because of what he accomplished, because of the sin of, of Israel, what he accomplished here. So it's not only my own sin that was dealt with here, 
It was the sin of all Israel. It, just, it gets much, much more deep. What well, you say, pass through the blood of, of the Messiah. Kind of so let's go to um, John. Well, you guys can tell me. Where did he say, I, these are the words of Messiah, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 6, 14. So down here, and this is definitely what we're going to see when we get into the study of Revelation, because what we see associated with the wedding of the Lamb and His bride is blessings. What we see down here with the judgment of the harlot is cursings and death and judgment. So would you agree, according to all of Scripture, all men have and women have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. True or false? So every human being starts here or starts here? Start here. What do we all deserve? Judgment and death. What is the only way to life and the Father? Through His sacrifice. I am the way, the truth, and the life. None come to the Father except through Him. It's a unique claim. And what's fascinating is when we do a comparative religion study and we look at all of the deities of all of these religions that spawn from the same location, which is fascinating to see, none of these messiahs, not, not uh, Tammuz, not um, Horus, not Mithra, uh, not Jupiter, none of these, none of these messiahs claim to be the way. They just point to a way, but don't claim to be the way. This is a unique claim that we find in Scripture. Interesting. You can read the next verse. It says, yeah. if you really know me, you will know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Because they saw who? Jesus. Oh. Now we're getting into your conundrum. Three, three and one, an egg. Uh, it gets deep fast. It gets deep very fast. But that's, mm, hang on to that one. Because that is consistent with what we read in Isaiah. The Lord is one, is one. Mm, I thought he was three. Well, is this just a bunch of finite beings trying to understand the infinite and listening to priests instead of reading the scriptures for ourselves? I don't know. Maybe. All right, we got four minutes left. I, here's the way I look at it: with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We, for all, I was raised in a church. Okay, we've always had one plus one plus one. And then <laughs> one doesn't matter. It doesn't quite add up. But if you go one times one times one, you still get one. Mm -hmm. One cubed is one. Mm -hmm. So. That's probably the better way to play it. Not one. Well, we're, we're not going to develop it tonight, but as soon as we think we've got the Trinity figured out, then what do we do with the seven spirits of God that seek all the earth for those who would know Him? Wait, seven? It gets deep. It gets deep. All right. But what, what I hope that we're doing is just kind of setting the stage for, okay, here we are today, and the way that we see ourselves today is absolutely the product of what we believe about our past and what we expect about our future. And so reading this as one contiguous story from Genesis to Revelation gives us a very, very broad framework. Now, it's up to us to go back and fill in all the gaps and read all the details of all of that, but this is a framework that we're testing. And we may end up saying, you know what, it's, it's not in, in agreement with each other, so we're just going to reject it. But that's what we're testing right here. So for next week, we're going to get into the story of Israel. Now, big picture, the second story of Israel. So we accomplished the first story of Israel. Now, the second story of Israel, this is, we're going to have to start over next week. This is a mess. The second story of Israel spans from uh, the King, King Solomon and his failure all the way to the second coming of the Messiah. So this is the second story of Israel. And we happen to fall. So two things, two very important things, I would argue, are falling within the second story of Israel. One is the first coming of the Messiah. And two, where we find ourselves today. So those are a number of things that we're going to be looking at.
But here's the overarching kind of the short story of the second story of Israel. So first, here in the first story of Israel, we have the promises made to Abraham be in his seed, this Goy Gadal, becoming a great nation in the land, but only a partial fulfillment. Now, what we're going to see at the very beginning of the second story of Israel is unity lost because of unrepentant sin. And then we're going to see land lost because of unrepentant sin, but for a purpose. That is the overarching story of the second story of Israel. And what we're going to see that is so important that actually, I think, in my opinion, and I want to I test this with you, I think looking at the division of the 12 tribes of Israel because of unrepentant sin and everything that happened in Scripture and in secular history helps to answer this question. Who are we? Because in my opinion, there's massive confusion in our culture of what it means to be a Jew, what it means to be of Israel, and what it means to be a Gentile. There's massive confusion. And so by looking at the second story of Israel straight out of Scripture, I think it's going to help to answer some of those questions. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. I look forward to next week. More questions to come. Thanks, guys.